Good morning, Grace. We are so excited to have you here this morning. Um, I know it's Time Change Sunday, so you guys are rock stars for the nine o'clock service to be here. So um, we are, yeah, extra thankful that you're here this morning. I hope you grabbed a piece of that uh, caffeinated chocolate as you walked in this morning. Don't give it to your kids you have kids with you. Um, But we're going to start the service by singing a few songs. We're going to start off with a new song um, that just talks about giving thanks to God in all circumstances. So we'd love um, to teach you that. um, And when you have it, sing with us. So if you would, go ahead and stand with us. So I Thanks to God when I don't have enough Cause He's more than enough And He knows what I need I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough Cause He's more than enough And He knows what I need Now let's sing that together. I'll give thanks. Oh, I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough Cause He's more than enough and He knows what I need I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough Cause He's more than enough and He knows what I In the morning you sing over me I receive your mercy Your faithfulness is clear to see It's constant every day Every breath I breathe an invitation to believe you are creating something good Though the seasons doesn't tell my story I know you'll move mountains for me You're just that good So I'll give thanks to God When I don't have enough Cause He's more than enough
God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for loving us. God, thank you for knowing exactly what we need in every circumstance and in every season, God. Thank you for walking right alongside us, for being enough when we feel like we don't have enough, God. God, thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. We love you so much. We pray these things in your name. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me to the fire. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. Thank you for clapping. Good morning, everybody. Who loves bread? 
Anybody love bread? Like I can make a whole meal off of bread. I just love, love bread. When I was a kid, I just liked just butter on the bread. And then my mother-in-law made these great hot rolls and put the butter on it and some honey. Oh my gosh. Now I can just take the bread and dip it in olive oil. I used to never like that, but now I like dip it in olive oil. Does anybody still eat Wonder Bread? Do they still sell Wonder Bread? No, no. Bagels, anybody like bagels? Bagels, yes. Oh yeah, how about pizza? Pizza, pizza, thin crust? Uh, thin crust or thick crust? Thick, thick, thick. I like the thin, I'm a thin person now. Uh, I'm not thin, but you know what I'm saying? I like, the, I like the thin crust. You know what my favorite type of bread is? Donuts. Donuts, yes, yeah. Uh, anybody a fan of Krispy Kreme is your favorite donut? Because I sure am. I mean, I just, I can't, it's an addiction. So I never have them because once I start having them, I can't stop them. You know, it's one, and then before I know it, it's two, it's three. I wanna tell you about a new type of bread that I have discovered. It's called the Ted Tart. This is their number one Ted Tart that they have. Would anybody like to sample a Ted Tart over here? Anybody over here? But could you just, could you, could you just? There you go, there you go. How about, how? <sighs> look at that. <laughs> All right, my man. He looks so excited. I got to choose. I'm sorry. I got to choose from somebody over here. I got to be fair. Who wants to? Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. Now, listen. I hope you, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, they rave about them. Next week, we are going to give out a Ted's Tart to everybody. Yes. We have a special deal with Ted's Bulletin, and we're going to have Ted's Tart for absolutely everybody. Say that a few times fast. Ted Tart, you're really going to get messed up. But anyway, we're going to have our grand opening next week, and it's going to be a huge celebration. I don't know if you saw it when you came in. We finally have our sign above the door, and we finally have signs outside that wall. So we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Next week, we hope to even take another step closer. But next week is going to be a huge party. We're going to celebrate with Ted's Tart, and we're going to finally talk about why Jesus says we can't live on bread alone. So Eat up for now, okay? Just eat all the bread you can can for this week. Uh, we have a bunch of these mailers on the welcome table. If you want to invite somebody to get a free TED Start next week, please just hand them the mailer. And uh, that's all I have to say. So great to see everybody. Thank you for waking up and being at the 9 o'clock service this morning, even though, even though you lost an hour of sleep. Please get some caffeinated chocolate on your way out. God bless. Good morning. How are we doing today? I'm glad you guys are here, even with a one less hour of sleep. You guys uh, get a little, get into heaven a little quicker. Uh, you get some God points on your chart. Uh, that next service and the final one, they don't get that. So, um, so I'm Brian. Want to again welcome you. This is the final iteration in our Find Your People series, and uh, I want to begin by just showing a picture of my son Eli. So this is Eli, this is about two years ago, so it's a little bit dated now, but I absolutely love it. One, because it's cute. Two, it, it was a defining point for him in terms of baseball, learning the fundamentals of throwing and catching. And he's gotten pretty good at it. We have a bit of fun. Uh, but what I realized, so he's seven now. I also have a three-year-old son. And what I realized is now I have a whole bunch of these hard baseballs laying around the house. And uh, let me show you how my three-year-old likes to play. <laughs> he doesn't quite have the same sweet, gentle demeanor as Eli. And if you're a parent, you've ever played baseball with a three-year-old, you know there's a couple things that could happen. So you start out, and you want them to get the sense of catching, right? So you, you get down nice and low, and you're, you know, you're three, three or four feet away, and you toss the ball to them, right? And Isaac does an amazing job catching. And then he gets the ball and he goes <laughs> three feet away. And so your life flashes before your eyes and that ball starts to come and you do one of these because you don't know where it's going. You don't know how fast it's going. Like it's incredibly terrifying. Have you ever been in a conversation like that where you're 
standing across from somebody and all of a sudden they're ready to throw a fast pitch at you and you're three or four feet away and they're not caring about where your words are go- their words are going, how angry they are or how you will respond. And what happens? Those defenses go up real quick, right? Well, last week we talked about speaking the truth to love. We all wanna get down to the truth because we know that once we kind of uncover the truth, that's where the meaning of life comes in. We wanna live our lives by the things of truth, but the truth can be hard to swallow. It's like this movie. Have anybody guess what scene this is from? A few good men. men. You can't handle the truth. And that's the truth. We we struggle to, to take in the truth, but last week John told us to speak truth to love. And our responses a lot of times to truth can be like playing baseball with a three-year-old. Somebody comes up and it's like, hey, let me tell you something. All of a sudden the guard goes up. We've been going through Luke over the past number of weeks. And I got to chapter four, which is where we're going to focus today. And I began to say, man, what am I going to say out of this? What's going to make a difference? Because it's, if you know Luke 4, there's this great sermon by Jesus to Nazareth, and we're going to read it in a minute. But I'm looking, I'm like, I've heard so many sermons about this. Then all of a sudden, something hit me. Something that challenged me, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Because in this story of Luke 4, the town of Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, responds with incredible anger and defensiveness. And if you've heard any of my story, as a teen, I grew up with a lot of anger. I had an alcoholic father. It was, uh, he was very controlling. He was either indifferent or angry is how I would characterize him. And I spent so much of my childhood wanting his love, his approval, wanting to be part of a conversation. I was just had so much anger, wanting to break things, wanting to hurt things, but felt powerless to do anything. And With kids, you realize that kids can be kind of like a mirror, right? They start doing and sounding and acting like you. And that's terrifying. Um, Because one night I was having a difficult conversation with my son, Eli. And uh, we're kind of in this argument. And all of a sudden he gives me this face, this angry face. I said, why you give me that face? He's like, because you're giving me that face. And then I realized his face, that was my face, was my dad's face. This bulldog face. And at that point, like, I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So it's now been turned the resting Parker face. (laughs) This morning, I feel compelled to talk about anger and defensiveness. I know it's not a popular topic. It's not one I really want to talk about at all but it's something that God has been working on in me and I believe it stands as one of the biggest barriers to our relationships, both with each other and with God. So here's one we need to know about anger. Studies have shown that it's a secondary emotion. It's not a primary emotion. It's like an iceberg. So we have anger up here at the top and that's what gets pushed out and everybody sees, but underneath there's all these primary feelings going on. And because anger is so visible, it can create a real defense mechanism. Stephen Stosny writes a book called Treating Attachment Abuse. He offers a chemical explanation of how anger in the moment can act as a psychological salve, like it's healing. He writes this, whether individuals are confronted with physical or psychological pain or the threat of such pain, the internal activation of anger response will precipitate a release of a chemical designed to numb it. Anger helps us numb the pain. It covers our core hurts. Here's what he says. Anger as a defense mechanism keeps people away and provides a feeling of control over a situation. I love this final quote. Unfortunately, reacting in anger can lead to additional issues in a relationship. Surprise. (laughs) If you didn't know that, anger can create issues in a relationship. He's a PhD, so we got to believe it. So let's look at Luke 4. Let's read our story this morning. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Now, Nazareth is Jesus' hometown. Anybody grow up in a small hometown? Like graduating class, 40 or 50 less? Anybody that small? So if Jesus had gone to like a traditional high school, his class would have been like five or seven, 
there was 200 to 400 people in his town. And if you're from a small town, you know stories travel. Like you know each other really well. Nazareth is so insignificant and small that it's not mentioned until Jesus comes on the scene. Like it's nowhere on the map. And so this is what Jesus does, continue on in Luke. Jesus stood up to read and the scroll of prophet, the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found a place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in that small town, in the synagogue, were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Now, what a powerful message. So you've got an insignificant town, Nazareth, and they're hearing this message that hope and healing and favor is coming. And they start looking around each other and they're like, finally, we're gonna be on the map. Like God is coming here and the person who's gonna do it is from our town. It's gonna to be remarkable for us. Now I've heard a lot of teachings and this sermon that Jesus gives is amazing. These passages he quotes from Isaiah and it launches his ministry. But Nazareth kind of misses the point. They misunderstand Jesus. How do they identify him? Let's look at the last verse again. Back another one, Heather. Um, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? What's important to note is that they identify him as Joseph's son, but Luke, our author, gives us a clue, a couple verses earlier, that they're misunderstanding who Jesus is. So Luke 3 22, 23, Jesus is being baptized. And it reads like this. The Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. So Luke, putting these two stories back to back, is saying, okay, Nazareth is getting frustrated. They're misunderstanding Jesus. And Luke uses a special term, so it was thought, in Greek, that, that says it was an assumption wrongly made, is the undertone of so it was thought. It was an assumption wrongly made. And because they have this wrong assumption, they get very angry with Jesus. And if you know anything about anger, so much of anger comes from being misunderstood or misunderstanding someone else. So what does Jesus do? So there's a misunderstanding in the air. And what does Jesus do? He clears the air. Luke 4, 23 to 24. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you'll tell me, do here in your hometown what you have done in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I love how Eugene Peterson puts it. He says, well, let me tell you something. Have you ever been in a relationship where somebody said, well, let me tell you something? Or maybe you've done that. How did it go? <laughs> like, was it just an award-winning conversational starter? Like, you know, something, when we hear that, something rises up inside of us. Those defenses go up because you know something's coming in hard and fast. Jesus tries to clear the air. In this proverb, physician, heal yourself, he's telling Nazareth, it's old saying, basically a physician was expected to take care of himself and those closest to him first in the first century. And so Nazareth is being called out. Jesus is looking at him saying, hey, I just gave you this great message that applies to the whole world. And Nazareth is saying, finally, we get it. And maybe not everybody else does. Like this is for us because he is Joseph's son. We know him, he owes us. So Jesus clears the air and he does it in a very unique way. He tells them that he's more than Joseph's son by quoting two Old Testament stories. Most of us usually gloss over, but they're in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It's the story of Elijah and Elisha. Let's read 
what Jesus says in Luke 4. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. And this is where the change happens. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off a cliff. Like things went serious real quick. Jesus goes from hero to hated in three verses. If you've ever been in a conversation, maybe been on a date, we, my wife and I, one Valentine's Day, we were sitting next to a couple and this happened to them. One story, one statement was made and the whole tone was changed, right? If you've ever been in a relationship like that, a conversation like that, man, everything's going great. And then you say one stupid thing and like the rest of the day is shot. Jesus goes from hero to hated in three verses. And for a long time, I'm like, why did they get so upset? Okay, he tells this cool story about Elijah and Elisha healing people. Isn't that great? Isn't that so cool? Isn't that something to be excited? Why did they get so mad? Well, Elijah and Elisha were prophets to northern Israel, not far from where Nazareth is. They were prophets. And the goal of a prophet is to give Jesus' message of, of God's message of truth to the people. And there were two things that characterized the people of northern Israel. They continually did evil in the eyes of the Lord and all the people worshiped other gods. So Jesus is telling the story of like these healings, but you have to notice the healings and the miracles take place for non-Israelites. Woman of Zarephath and Naaman of Syria. They're non-Israelites. And the reason why they're not Israelites is because Israel was so hardened to God's message that they wouldn't take it in. And it's at this point that Nazareth is starting to look around. They're reading between the lines and they're like, is he talking about us? Like Jesus kind of sliding this in. They're like, wait a second. I think he's talking about us. I think he gave us like a backhanded, we didn't know it was coming, but he hit us with something. There was some truth there. And what was their reaction? They were furious. So I want to read 2 Kings because it's a very interesting story. And there's a difference between Nazareth and Naaman that we need to pay attention to. Naaman, this great king of Syria. 2 Kings reads like this. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots. Naaman has leprosy and he's looking for somebody to heal him. And he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me, stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. So he went off in a rage. Then Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more when he tells you wash and be cleansed? He gets angry because there's not something difficult and his servants come out and challenge him a little bit, gently, softly challenge him and say, hey, he's not asking you to do anything amazing or difficult. Why don't you just try it? And Naaman is healed. What's fascinating here is that Naaman is said to get furious with Elisha. Twice he gets furious. This image of furious is kind of like uh, putting too much uh, lighter fluid on a charcoal grill. Anybody ever done that? Maybe just for fun or maybe because you couldn't get it lit. Um, I had a coach once, I was about 12 or 13 years old and this coach was really arrogant. He was kind of cruel to the, to the kids a little bit and uh, we all went to this cookout to celebrate the end of the season. And he just could not get that thing lit. And I mean, for 10 briquettes, he was putting on like a gallon of lighter fluid. And he's like, this thing is gonna go and it's gonna be awesome. And so he tosses a match on there and whoosh, eyebrows singed. Like it was the best humbling moment I've ever seen in my life. And that's the image of rage, image of anger that the Bible's talking about. It comes from these two words, thumos and chema, this Greek and Hebrew word, boiling up of anger, soon subsiding. It's a flash, a burst. 
In the Hebrew, it's hot displeasure, heat, rage, indignation, burning anger. It's the type of anger that causes us to go, wait, that wasn't me. Like, I don't know where that came from, but that wasn't me. It just kind of rolls out of us and takes over. Luke 4, 28 and 2 Kings 5, 12, they're the same word. 2 Kings is originally written in Hebrew, translated to Greek, and they use the same Greek word, thumos, in both, because they... Jesus is intentionally drawing reference to 2 Kings. He's trying to show Israel something. He's trying to show Nazareth something that will change their situation. So what's the difference between Naaman and Nazareth? Naaman was able to slow down. He slowed the conversation down. John Gottman, marriage therapist, been doing it for 40 years, states that defensiveness is any attempt to defend oneself from a perceived attack. It is often accompanied by counter-complaining, counter-attacking. The game plan is usually deflect, divert, attack, defend. Anger is a powerful defense mechanism, a way to protect ourselves and escape the discomfort of the real situation or the emotions. It's that iceberg image again, where anger's at the surface, but all this other stuff is going on underneath. And people usually see and react to the anger and anger is the thing that we can say, no, I was just angry, but we don't express or connect with the real emotions. So what are the things that help us break down this anger, this defensiveness? From Naaman, what we see with Jesus is we have to slow things down. We have to sit with discomfort. That last one is not fun. The reason why we, we run to anger, I run to anger so often is because I wanna ignore the emotions, the situation. I wanna smooth out the conversation. I don't wanna face what I had just done or what somebody had just done to me. When I'm throwing the ball with Isaac, now knowing the power of his arm and the tenacity of his personality, the first thing I do is, okay, throw it slow. I'm right here, throw it slow. And when we're in relationships and we're, we're in conversations, sometimes we need to give people the freedom to go slow. We pride ourselves in that quick retort, that quick comment, that witty remark, or you know, we think in the after fact, ah, if I just said that one thing, I could have had this statement to follow that up with. That's actually not the goal. We gotta slow it down. Because when we slow it down, we can respond more intentionally. There's a small book that I picked up recently. It's called Speak to Me Like Someone You Love. Speak to Me Like Someone You Love. Because we, this author, Dr. Dreyfus, realizes that in the heat of the moment, we don't speak with love a lot of times. We speak with anger. We speak with defensiveness. And so she's compiled this book with a number of index cards. And the goal of the index cards is to get to the, the heart of what you wanna communicate, get you both back on the same page. And she struggled with, and I had the same thought. I was like, okay, if I'm having a fight with somebody, how do I grab the right index card, right? Like you wanna be able to sort through and be like, bam, there you go. Everything's done. I wanna read a quote from her book because she expressed the same frustration I did. She says, over the years, people sometimes question me on the user friendliness of the whole idea. Typically, I get, how am I supposed to go look up a message and use it when I'm triggered? It feels clunky, and it takes time. Toward this end, I spent years contemplating how the indexing of the set could be maximally functional. But recently, I have rethought this. If the magic communication elf, anybody wish they had a magic communication elf? Like, I feel like that would be something we could market really easily. If the magic communication elf instantly put the perfect message in your hands, believe me, something would be lost. The point isn't just to calm your partner. It is to consciously shift gears and choose to be in your right mind over your reactive one. That's what Naaman does. He slows it down just enough that he's able to choose the right mind over the reactive one. And what happens? It results in his healing. It's an amazing thing. When you have something hard to say, can you give your partner a clue or your coworker or your friend a clue? Hey, this might be difficult. 
You don't have to give me a response right now. You don't have to say anything right now. Give them the freedom to withhold that response. Or if you're on the receiving end of somebody throwing that fastball at you, those words come wild and fast. If you have a structured, intentional way to respond already in your mind, it goes a long way. We have several staff members, and I've seen this over and over again, that when something is getting ready to share, they go to this, this face. <laughs> you ever, ever been there? Like you sharing something, all of a sudden your partner's like, because they're trying to hold it back. They're trying to process and they realize if I say something right now, I could be in big trouble. There's some other things that have helped me. Some things, some structured sayings that I encourage you to think through. What fits for you? One could be, hmm, just that pause or thanks for sharing. Let me think about that or that's a great question. Structure allows us to slow it down. These often work best when you, you say them, you share them, and then you take a break. But you have to come back to it. You can't be like, okay, let me think about that, and then it's gone forever. Like, that'll destroy a relationship. But if you actually think about it, if you sit with it a while, and you come back, it begins to bring healing, because it allows you to be in the right mind rather than the reactionary one. We see this with Jesus' disciples all the time. Jesus says something and people get upset and angry and half the crowd leaves and the disciples go back to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, what did you mean by that? And they re-engage that conversation because they've wrestled with it. They've slowed it down just enough. I get it. We don't like discomfort. I don't like that discomfort. I'd rather sit at the top of that iceberg with just that anger and say, ah, they just made me so angry and ignore the pain, the hurt, the frustration, the embarrassment, all the things that come with it. But if we wanna see our relationships grow, if we wanna see our faith grow, we have to get into the mess. Proverbs 16, 32 says this, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules a city, rules his spirit, is better than he that takes a city. And this is so important this characteristic, because it is a defining characteristic of God, Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, slow to anger. It's not just true in conversation, but when I'm reading the Bible, I can come across something and I'm like, ah, that, I don't like that, Jesus. Or that's a cultural thing, doesn't apply. Or I look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, it applies to those people. Those people are really messed up or they're worse than I am, and I gloss right over it, or I leave confused, but if I slow it down, and I sit with those words, and I read them, then my faith begins to take off, breaks down those barriers. We all have areas where we've put up a wall, where we've gone on the defensive. The Bible calls that having a hard heart, it protects us from the reality of the situation and the reality, the depth of that relationship. And it takes two things to overcome a hard heart, admitting it and inviting God in. We have to admit it to God. We have to admit it to ourselves, which is really hard. And then we have to humbly admit it to others, especially those who are impacted by it. And then we have to invite God in. We have to invite God in. Hebrews 3, 7 and 8 says this, so as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, that intentional decision to allow God in, to invite him in. If we're going to truly connect with God and others, we have to slow it down and sit with discomfort. We need open ears and soft hearts. And as we admit those things, as we invite God in, this is what God promises, Ezekiel 11. I will give them an undivided heart put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone, that hard heart, and give them a heart of flesh. Do you tend to throw the baseball too hard? Are you just like chucking it at everybody in your way? Words are coming out. You're not concerned about where the words are going or the impact that they're having. Or maybe you've walked through life and man, people have just been chucking that ball at you all day long. And you're just walking around. The fences are always up. You're always guarded. Admitting that and inviting God in are a powerful way to start. And that's the first step that we can take today. I do wanna let you know if that's you, we do partner with Safe Harbor. 
It's a great counseling organization, a place to process that because you can start this process today, but just because we pray and we admit it doesn't mean it changes. I've been working over anger and defensiveness for years and I see it keep popping up. But until we join the spiritual and the psychological, we will not find complete freedom. So we're gonna pray this morning and close with a song that I want us to use as a way to admit, invite God in. So if you will, let's bow our heads. God, it is challenging when things hit us. Lord, our reactions are seemingly out of our control so often. And then we look back and we're like, man, where did that come from? We can see the devastation of its path and it's easiest to just say the thing that calms the situation, that quick apology, that quick response to just move on past the discomfort. And I pray that today would be a beginning point of admitting those things, those angers, those pains, those frustrations, those defenses, that those barriers would begin to come down that we would be able to invite you in to bring amazing healing to what's happening inside of us and in our relationships. God, we're so grateful for this opportunity that you have taught us something through this juxtaposition of Naaman and Nazareth. And we pray that we would be slowing things down like Naaman, that we would truly be hearing and that you would give us a soft heart in your name, amen. As I said, we're gonna close with a song. It's called Make Room. And the opening line is, here is where I lay it down. This is my surrender. What defenses, what barriers do you need to lay down today? What angers, what pains do you need to lay down? Because as we lay them down, those barriers begin to come down. If you will, let's stand and sing together. Here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender, this is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender, and I will make room. For you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground all my tradition break down the walls all my religion your way is better oh, your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better Do whatever 
do whatever you want to I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us this morning, especially on one hour less sleep. That's impressive. I got to tell you, it's impressive that you're here. Um, Also, what is super impressive is just how much food has been uh, coming in for for this food drive. Just super grateful for uh, such a generous church. And thank you guys so much. Um, You do have a few hours left. If uh, if you just want to run out to uh, to Harris Teeter or CVS downstairs and come back up, we we would love that. And uh, one last thing I want to tell you, um, if you would like prayer today, maybe something in today's message really spoke to you and you just would like someone to pray for you, our prayer team is right over here on this wall. They would love to pray with you. And if you're new to Grace, um, we'd love to meet you. It takes about five minutes. It's called Grace in Five. It happens right here where Brian is standing. Uh, Just come see us. We'll say hi. God bless you guys. Have an amazing week.